truthless. Hey yo. Um, I just wanted to share hold on. <laughs> I just wanted to share my um new herb I've been trying. Um share this information with you all. I understand that we're in um dire times, but I'm not just into one thing, you know. You have to take care of your health. Um, this is a new herb I've been taking now for about three weeks to a month. I don't even remember how long, but it's working. I like it. I feel lighter, way lighter. Um, I started out using a little one this morning. I used like three teaspoons, three tape, no, yeah, three teaspoons, and it was good. And I'm eating seaweed. It's crunchy like chips. It's dehydrated. Um, welcome back to my YouTube family. Um, welcome to my new subscribers. And I'm just going to go right into this video. When I stated I just started taking this. Um, this is a channel that I subscribe to. Y'all go over and subscribe. Give me one moment. All right. We're going to watch this, y'all. Superfood Evolution presents Trifla Powder, an Ayurvedic formula for healthy bowels. Trifla Powder is a specific Ayurvedic formulation composed of three dried fruits, Amalaki, Maritaki, and Bibitaki. It is one of India's most valued and commonly utilized household herbs. Used on a daily basis as a digestive tonic and for improved bowel regularity, it is believed to eliminate the root cause of many diseases that often begin from stagnant conditions and gastrointestinal imbalance. Each of the dried fruits that make up the ground powder, or Trifla Cherna, are known to collectively work to positively potentiate the qualities of each other, uniquely offering both nutritive as well as colon cleansing properties. Consuming Trifla tea or tablets therefore helps to gently clear intestinal excess while simultaneously strengthening digestion and one's ability to assimilate nutrients. Trifla's distinctive therapeutic actions are due in part to its special flavor characteristics which include the five tastes, sweet, sour, pungent, bitter, and astringent. For this reason, Trifla is considered a tridoshic herbal formula. A term referring to the three doshas, vata, pitta, and kapha. In the Ayurvedic system, these are the primary constitutional forces that govern the human body. Trifla powder is not energetically too cold or too hot, and is thus well tolerated by all three body types. Oh, yeah, because of its versatility and appropriateness for a wide range of people, it is one of the most frequently prescribed herbal formulations used extensively by Ayurvedic practitioners since the beginning of Vedic times, as both a straight herb or an ingredient in many other alchemical compounds. Trifla can be considered a Rasayana tonic because of its rejuvenating attributes that enhance one's strength and regulate immunity. It is notably high in a number of antioxidants, like phenolic constituents and vitamin C, which have been shown to act as immunomodulators as well as prevent oxidative stress. Bowel irregularity and chronic constipation are common conditions that afflict many individuals worldwide. Herbal laxatives as a result are one of the most popular products in the health supplement industry. Unlike strong purgatives, however, Trifla is safe Sorry. for long-term use. Okay. Or can be prescribed when symptoms arise. It is traditionally used as a powder called Trifla Cherna, stirred into hot water and consumed as a steeped, lukewarm, powder infused liquid. It is generally recommended that you take Trifla supplements or tea on an empty stomach first thing in the morning and or an hour before bed for several months once or twice daily for highest health benefits. I'll just take it once a day in the morning. According to one's health goals and objectives. 
Triplet can be used in smaller doses for its nutritive and cleansing attributes that can gently remove excess ama or toxins from the body, working as a mild blood purifier without causing intense detox reactions. Or likewise, it can be employed in larger doses to promote stronger laxative qualities to alleviate constipated bowels and intestinal stagnation. In addition, triplet powder supplementation is regarded as a potent medicinal substance for its antiarthritic, anti-inflammatory, and antiviral qualities. It is known to be beneficial for body weight management, reducing serum cholesterol, increasing dental hygiene, clearing the skin, and improving the eyesight. The results of a study published in Alternative Therapies in Health and Medicine revealed that triphala and its constituents can counter the effects of high dietary fat intake and have the potential for use as anti-obesity agents with desirable lipid profile modulating properties. While triphala enhances the process of digestion and elimination, it also has a side effect, improves the functioning of the liver, gallbladder, and kidneys by purifying the blood and opening up the detoxification pathways. Triphala powder consumed daily in warm water can be a highly effective treatment for removing congestion and reducing stress on these eliminatory channels and organ systems. What is triphala powder? The term triphala literally means three fruits, tri, three, and phala, fruit. This is because it is not a plant itself, but an herbal formulation that consists of three specific and rather unusual looking fruits indigenous to the subcontinent of India. These are Amalaki, Haritaki, and Bibitaki. Each of these dried fruits possess different properties that help to provide for its well-rounded attributes and synergistic effects. Triphala powder, usually created from equal proportions of these dried fruits, is one of the foundational herbal formulas of Ayurveda, the traditional system of East Indian medicine. Its referenced use is found in many ancient Hindu texts, like the Sharaka Samhita and the Sushruta Samhita, where it is infused as straight triphala churna powder into hot water and consumed as a warm tea-like liquid or is likewise utilized as an ingredient in many complex Ayurvedic preparations. According to the book Rasayana, Ayurvedic Herbs for Longevity and Rejuvenation, there are differing opinions about proportions used for triple up formulations. Traditionally, one part of each of the three fruits by weight is standard, but other recipes include one part Haritaki, two parts Bibitaki, and three parts Amalaki by weight, or one part Haritaki, two parts Vivitaki, and four parts Amalaki by weight. About triple of fruits, Amalaki, Haritaki, and Vivitaki. Amalaki, or Amla, is a type of berry also referred to as Indian gooseberry. It's from the species Emblica officinalis, a sacred Hindu tree believed to be protected by the god Vishnu. The Amla tree is ritually worshipped on the Hindu holiday called Amalaki Ekadashi. All parts of the tree are useful, but the dried ground fruit is in particular applied in medicinal preparations. Of the three fruits, Amla is the most commonly used as a superfruit variety because of its concentrated source of natural vitamin C content. Dried Amla fruit is cooling in nature helpful for balancing pitta when excess heat or inflammation is present. It is cleansing to the body and is known to improve liver function and boost immunity. It is composed of the primary taste, sour and astringent, with secondary bitter, pungent and sweet flavors. Some of the phytochemical compounds include nicotinic acid, riboflavin, tannins, carotene, as well as vitamin C. Paritaki is a small, ribbed, nut-like fruit from the tree species Terminalia chebula. The center seed is usually removed, and the fleshy, firm pulp is the part dried to make haritake powder. It has a heating energy, and is identified by its scraping actions, which help to eliminate toxins. There are approximately seven different varieties of haritake fruits, including Vijaya, Bohini, Abaya, Putana, Marita, 
shiitake, and jibanti. The Vijaya variety is usually the one preferred over others when making triple echerna. This comprises of the tastes sweet, sour, pungent, bitter, and astringent. Haritake is considered one of the best herbs for balancing the vata dosha. Some of the phytochemical compounds include anthroquinones, tannins, and other polyphenolic Sorry. compounds like glycosides I'm and triterpenes. Bibitake, also referred to as balearic, is the fruit of the Terminalia balearica tree species. The fruit pulp has a laxative effect. It helps to clear excess mucus accumulation, or ama, from the body. Bibitake additionally contains high amounts of polyunsaturated oil content. It is viewed as a good herb for kapha constitutions and is primarily astringent in taste with a secondary sweet, bitter, and pungent flavor. Some of the phytochemical compounds include gallic acid, tannic acid, and glycosides. Health benefits of Trifla. Supports bowel functions. Ayurveda aims at treating the root cause of disease, not merely alleviating various symptoms. Often the foundation of this begins in balancing digestive and eliminatory disorders before they start to accumulate block detoxification pathways and disrupt the flow of other bodily organ systems. This is a preventative approach to illness and disease widely practiced in both Ayurvedic and Chinese medical systems. Frequently symptoms like chronic bloating, gas, fatigue, constipation, food cravings, abdominal pain, candida, hormonal imbalance, allergies, headaches, and inflammatory disorders can be a sign that there is obstruction and congestion, especially in the large intestine and colon region. In Ayurveda, the colon is viewed as the seat of vata, so herbs like triphala can be very helpful for vata disorders like constipation or too much wind in the digestive tract, which causes bloating and flatulence. It can be used in a dose-dependent manner as a gentle, mild, or strong laxative. Because of its tridoshic nature, it is appropriate, however, for a wide range of people when constipation or irregular bowel elimination is an issue. Regular daily bowel movements are a vital component to health and wellness, and a critical part of the detoxification process. Triflin not only helps to support healthy bowel functions and proper deprivation, as we mentioned, it is additionally purifying to the blood and two other eliminatory organs, the liver and the kidneys. Trifla, however, is different than other types of herbal laxatives in that it combines both a purgative quality as well as a nutritional component. Containing constituents like bitter anthroquinones, it gently works to stimulate peristaltic actions directly or through the secretion of bile via the gallbladder and liver. It is not, however, depleting to the body with long-term use, like other herbal laxatives like Senna, Cascara Sagrada, or Rhubarb. Unlike these varieties, Trifla powders and tablets are also not habit-forming. A study published in the Journal of Ayurveda and Integrative Medicine comparing the use of both Trifla and Senna, it was stated that Trifla gently cleanses the colon and relieves symptoms like anorectal blockage, sensation or incomplete evacuation, flatulence and bloating. In contrast to Senna, a strong purgative, Trifla powder strengthens and tones up the musculature of the bowel and does not cause dependence. Trifla powder as a digestive tonic. Consuming Trifla powder as a warm tea mixture supports one's digestive fire, so that nutrition can be absorbed and waste materials eliminated. Trifla is also considered to be more of a tonic because of its antioxidant compounds like vitamin C, as well as its polyunsaturated omega oils. In addition to providing bowel regularity, it also benefits several areas of digestion, such as helping to break down food in the stomach, the catabolism of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates in the small intestine, and the absorption of any remaining nutrients in the colon. 
Digestion is where it all begins. If we can keep this system running smoothly through good dietary practices, sattvic food choices, as well as periodic cleansing protocols, we can often prevent many unnecessary related health issues further down the road. For this reason, Triple is recommended Sorry. and used more often than any other Ayurvedic herbal formulation as a straight powder or as an ingredient in many traditional herbal preparations. One of the best parts about Trifla is that it can be taken for its cleansing actions without having to significantly alter dietary practices. Of course, we always encourage a health-promoting diet and lifestyle, along with occasional cleansing regimes, but generally speaking, daily use of Trifla tea or tablets over a one to three month period can complement most any diet. Trifla for weight loss and lipid lowering properties. Trifla powder is a popular herbal remedy for increasing weight loss when excess body weight or obesity is a chronic issue. Oftentimes, digestion, which further impedes digestive assimilation and liver function. Although modifying one's diet and exercise activities is highly advised in any weight loss program, Trifla can be taken twice daily for several months as a supplemental adjunct for increased effectiveness. The complete taste spectrum that Trifla fruits provide naturally promotes increased absorption of nutrients which helps to satisfy the appetite and eliminate food cravings. Trifla powder steeped in hot water or mixed into blended over tablets or capsules so that taste sensations can be activated in the mouth. In research analyzing Trifla's actions as an anti-obesity agent, it was demonstrated to counter the effects of a high-fat diet and was shown to have lipid-lowering effects on LDL and total serum cholesterol levels. Another classic Ayurvedic preparation for weight management is called Trifla Gugulu. This is a combination of long pepper, the three Trifla fruits, and Gugulu. Gugulu is a type of plant resin known for its detoxifying actions and is particularly beneficial for increasing digestive fire, encouraging healthy metabolism, and removing excess kapha from the body. High in antioxidants. Trifla powder, being a combination of three different fruit varieties, contains a well-rounded amount of antioxidants. It is rich in polyphenols, glycosides, alkaloids, and tannins, such as chebulagic acid and gallic acid. According to one study, its specific antioxidative effect is more efficient due to the combined activity of the individual components. These compounds help to reduce oxidative stress and prevent free radical damage. The specific substances in trifla powders and supplements also act as immune system modulators, increasing or decreasing the immune response depending on what is most appropriate. In a study published in the Indian Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences, it was reported that the use of trifla and its three individual constituents as potential immunostimulants and or immunosuppressants further suggests them to be a better alternative for allopathic immunomodulators. In other research, the use of trifla powder was identified to significantly increase beneficial immune cells, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, and natural killer cells. In one study conducted on arthritis in mice, it was concluded that the results obtained clearly indicate the fact that the Indian Ayurvedic herbal formulation trifla has promising anti-inflammatory activity. Benefits to the eyes and skin. Trifla is also widely utilized for improving the health of the eyes, for use as supplemental treatment for certain eye diseases like conjunctivitis in early stages of cataracts and glaucoma. This is predominantly due to its antioxidant-rich compounds like vitamin C and carotene, as well as its blood purifying attributes. Remember that cleansing substances often tend to go hand in hand with eyesight and skin improvements. In research evaluating the anti-cataract potential of trifla, it was demonstrated that 
Triflet prevents selenite-induced experimental cataractogenesis in vitro and in vivo. The three fruit powders in Triflet are incorporated in a well-known vision-improving Ayurvedic formulation called Saptamrita Lauha. Filtered Triflet teas can also be used topically as an eye wash using an eye cup or as drops to fortify visual functions and lessen strain on the eyes. In clinical research comparing Triflet eye drops and the intake of Saptamrita Lauha tablets, both were shown effective for computer vision syndrome by increasing ocular strength. According to the book Rasayana, Ayurvedic Herbs for Longevity and Rejuvenation, it is alleged that regular use of this compound for five to six months can improve eyesight to such an extent that glasses may not be required. Trifla's antioxidant content and liver cleansing properties not only help increase eye health, but also provide beneficial effects at clearing skin disorders often associated with toxic overload and liver stagnation. It can be used internally with turmeric powder to intensify these features. Amalaki or amla fruit being one of the highest sources of vitamin C also significantly adds to these skin healing qualities. Good for dental hygiene. Triflet contains antimicrobial properties that have been confirmed effective for improving dental hygiene and can be used in water as a type of natural mouthwash. In the 2014 journal Periodontal and Implant Science, it was shown that Triflet mouthwash herbal is an effective anti-plaque agent like 0.2% chlorhexidine. It is significantly useful in reducing plaque accumulation and gingival inflammation, gingivitis, thereby controlling periodontal diseases in every patient. It is also cost-effective, easily available, and well-tolerable with no reported side effects. The Taste of Triflet Powder Triflet powder, being a tridoshic formula, is very versatile and balancing to all three body types, vata, pitta, and kapha. Triflet's healing qualities are in part due to its mentioned combination of flavors, which include bitter, sour, sweet, pungent, and astringent. In Ayurveda, the sense of taste, or rasa, is considered an important element, which when balanced, nourishes plasma and feeds the bodily tissues. These taste dynamics are what allows Triflet to work on many levels, providing a cleansing yet tonifying effect. In this regard, it is traditionally consumed as a powder in warm water, so that the sense of taste is activated. It is believed that each individual experiences their own unique Triflet flavor, depending on what is most needed, with each taste having different effects on the body. These taste sensations can also shift with use as one's health improves. The potent antioxidants and nutritional compounds found in Amalaki, Bibitaki, and Haritaki give Triflet a potent flavor that is not likely to be very pleasing to the palate. For many Westerners who predominantly lack the bitter and astringent taste in their diet, drinking the tea can be initially strong tasting as these qualities will often be pronounced. Taste perception usually evolves over time, however, as one becomes more balanced. Types of Triphala Bulk powder, commonly made from equal parts of the three dried fruits. Tablets or capsules, created from the powder in compressed or encapsulated form. Liquid extracts. Liquid extracts are less common, but are available as an alcohol tincture. Formulations. Triflet is frequently used in many traditional Ayurvedic preparations. Recommended organic Triflet brands. Banyan Botanicals. Organic powder, tablets, and liquid extract. Lost Empire Herbs. Formerly super Oh. Herbs or okay, I was just gonna let it finish. I just got off work. I'm letting it play. Organic powder, organic India, organic capsules and powder, 
Mountain Rose Herbs, Organic Powder and Capsules. Star West Botanicals, Organic Powder. Planetary Herbals, Organic Tablets. How to Use. the number one way to use straight triphala is as a warm tea. This is essentially created by infusing triphala powder in hot or warm water and allowing it to sit for at least 20 minutes. It is also customarily left to infuse for longer periods or overnight and rewarmed for morning use. This is said to balance the taste of the fruits. As we mentioned, drinking triphala powder in water allows one to completely taste the herb, an important aspect to activating beneficial properties. Triffle of tea infusions are not usually strained. This means the powder will end up settling to the bottom of your glass. While it is not the most pleasant tasting experience, the powder can be quickly gulped for increased benefits. The second best option to using bulk triffle powder is taking a pure triffle supplement in capsule or tablet form. Tablets are recommended over capsules as there is some mild taste that occurs which helps to activate the digestive system. Lukewarm triphala tea or supplements should be consumed on an empty stomach first thing in the morning and or a few hours before bedtime. Dosage Regulation Amounts and doses may vary according to your health goals and body weight but usually one half to one teaspoon is used in one cup of hot or warm water twice daily. Generally larger dose amounts of up to one tablespoon will provide more laxative qualities, whereas smaller amounts around one quarter teaspoon act as gentle rejuvenating blood purifiers. Triflet is usually well tolerated by most people. But because there can be different reactions to the same dose of triphala, it is important to regulate the amount consumed according to one's bowel movements, either increasing or decreasing depending on stool structure. It may take several days to personally regulate appropriate dosage. You would typically use less powder in cases where loose stools are evident and more triphala powder when constipated. Precautions Consult your healthcare practitioner before using triphala powder if pregnant, breastfeeding, or trying to conceive. Excessive amounts can cause gastrointestinal side effects and loose stools, but usually subside when dosage amount is reduced. Seek the advice of your physician before use if you are taking prescription medications or have a serious medical condition. Thanks for watching. For additional information, studies, and links to the best sources of Trifla we can find, be sure and check out the description box below this video. Please share and support us with a thumbs up if you found it useful. And be sure and check out these other informative videos. products are tested and never diluted to ensure you are getting the highest quality oils. Get 35% off your next Piping Rock order. Click the link now to shop at pipingrock.com and save. Okay, y'all. Um, that was Trifala. As I said, I go over to this channel and I like it because, sorry, I like it because you can, um, I'll be familiar what I'm doing, y'all. I like it because you can, um, and I'm sitting here handling stuff that I wouldn't be able to handle, um, otherwise, oh, that's bright, y'all, I'm sorry. Let me see. <laughs> Okay. Too still, too bright. All right. 
Um, <laughs> y'all pay me no attention. But seriously, I was just sitting here uh, watching a video with y'all about trial follow. But before that, I was watching a video how to germinate seeds. And that's why I need a light so I can see. The dude, he wasn't um like technology rich. You know how some of these people, they have seeds and you lost. He went step by step. On some stuff and his method is simple he said you just drop them in some water which is what I'm doing um my sister brought these with her I am just hoping that they do well I didn't look up a video at first and ended up putting it straight in the dirt and my homeboy was like no you don't put it straight in the dirt he's been on a couple of my vlogs in the background but um I dropped them straight in the dirt and did they survive no and I didn't even think like he said you just put a finger indention in the dirt so that that if it sprouts that tail can be down in there I didn't even think about it being in a hard shell and not being able to push up through um this is a lot of different stuff and i'm just gonna go for it because i like planning i do i have to get me some more plants i overwatered my last set and i think that with clay pots it retains too much moisture moisture yeah clay pots i had terracotta pots and I had decorated them with stones. They were cute, but everything that I put in those pots ended up dying. It was so funny. I had left them at my mom's house for a minute. And I blamed her for killing the plants. I was like, Mama, you kill everything. Well, she really does kill everything. <laughs> you can have her give her a Chinese bamboo. And it won't last at her house. Um, I'm hoping everyone is doing well today. I was texting um, my sister Maddie about uh, this um, lunar calendar, this lunar information. And like I said, I go to different channels and I I use information. Um, I'm just loving the information sharing, so I'm going to share it with y'all as well. I can't quite get this lunar stuff and what she was saying is a more it's more spiritual. Like if you pay attention to the times you can really um your spirit will lead you in matching of the dates and stuff. And I believe that. Shout out to Maddie, thanks, sister. All right, guys. So I got some killer stuff at that conspiracy. <laughs> Why? Because I got some really, really killer genetics. We're going to just call them seed A, seed B. These are lead genetics. These, we're going to watch grow together, guys. We're hoping for a man. Uh, we're going to see what happens here. But um, as for now, we're just going to kind of just get right in here. We got eight seeds right here. Now, for me, just gonna kind of open it up like that. We can put a little bit of candy here for you guys to see. This is not what These I was meaning to put it on. <laughs> I need to stop. Okay, y'all. That was, this is a good video. Y'all go over and watch. Um, he's just a simple guy showing y'all how he um germinates his seeds. I was gonna reach out to Lord of the Universe, um, thirteen to ask him what to do, but it wouldn't let me um go into an email or anything i'll show y'all his plants in a minute but this is what i was talking about we have a family wellness practice and we are certified in pediatrics and pregnancy most people tell us that it's just a warm loving the new moon of december 29th and 30th was thought to be the start of the 10th month on the biblical calendar at the start of 2017. 
However, it was actually the start of the ninth month, and the short reason why yes, is that the full moon watch. of September 16th was Nine not nine, yeah. the turn of the year. Instead, the turn happened on October 16th last year. This is something that I missed, and I apologize to anyone who lives in the Southern Hemisphere, because I hadn't thought of this until now. The turn must be observed before the first month, and that includes the first month of the Southern Hemisphere, which occurs in the seventh month of the Northern Hemisphere. We'll do a quick recap on this, but for a more in-depth explanation, watch the video on the ancient calendar linked here or at the end of this video. Exodus 34.22 says, And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. And y'all, this is just a disclaimer. Fair use, fair use, fair use. But um, I'm not saying that she's absolutely correct. I'm just trying to learn how and what to look for when we're talking about um the moon and the turn of the moon against like I didn't study study astrology in school. So um I do feel that it's important for us to learn our calendar um and our moon cycles. The cycles it says that that's how we'll be able to tell the times and if we don't know that and that's another disadvantage we already have a lot of disadvantages that are against us so I'm able to receive information from anywhere and I'm not saying this is 100% accurate but what I am saying is I'm looking at the charts and stuff so that it can become familiar to me however neither of these feasts occur at the end of the year You'll notice that the Feast of Weeks, as explained in Leviticus 23, verses 10 through 17, starts the day after Passover, which is in the first month. And the Feast of Ingathering, also known as Tabernacles, we're told in verse 34, should be observed starting on the 15th day of the seventh month. So Exodus 34, 22 is telling us that the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Tabernacles should be observed at the year's end. But the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Tabernacles occur in the first and seventh months, which are the beginning and the middle, not the end, which would be in the 11th or 12th month. So this word translated as end, number 8622, must mean something else, and it does. It also means turn. So Exodus 34.22 is telling us that the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Tabernacles must be observed at the year's turn. There are four turnings of the year, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Weeks occurs in the spring, and tabernacles occurs in the fall. So Exodus 34 is referring to the spring and fall turns of the year. This makes sense because the actual turn that we can perceive on earth is the turn of the sun and moon at the equinoxes. So if we were to go out on the night of a full moon, we would see the sun set in the west and the full moon rise in the east. In the northern hemisphere summer, the sun sets to the right of due west, and in the northern hemisphere winter, the sun sets to the left of due west. The same thing occurs with the full moon rising in the east. In the northern hemisphere summer, the full moon rises to the right of due east, and in the northern hemisphere winter, the full moon rises to the left of due east. The turn happens when the sun and moon shift from their summer position to their winter position, and vice versa. We call this the equinox in modern times, but in ancient times, it was the turn. So for thousands of years, they had to go outside to observe the turn physically with their own eyes. And because they had to observe the turn of both the sun and moon, they would go out to observe on the night that the moon was most visible, the full moon. Also, because the turn is most visible at the horizon, and because the horizon is blocked by trees and other obstructions in some places, many people had to take a trip to a, either a high mountain or a coast to see the turn more clearly. And since they were usually traveling on foot, this could take weeks. 
So for this reason, it seemed to make the most sense that once the turn was observed on the full moon of the 12th month, they would start their first month two weeks later on the new moon. That gave them time to return home from whatever trip they had to take to view the horizon. We know they started their months on the new moons because the Hebrew word for month literally means new moon. However, if the full moon and the setting sun had not made the turn by the 12th month, then they would not start their first month on the following new moon. They would wait one more month to check for the turn again. That would mean that they would observe a 13th month on a year that the turn was late. This 13th month occurs every two to three years on any lunar solar calendar. The Jewish calendar also observes a 13th month. For example, they had a 13th month in 2016. So in 2012, we were using this method and it was one month behind the standard Jewish calendar. The full moon on March 8, 2012 was rising to the right of due east, so it had made the turn, but the sun was still setting to the left of due west, so it had not made its turn yet. So we waited one more month and checked for the turn on the full moon of April 6, 2012. And by that date, both the sun and moon had made their turn, so we started the first month on the new moon of April 21, 2012. That made the new moon of October 15th the start of the seventh month in the Northern Hemisphere, which is the Feast of Trumpets. We count both the technical new moon and the first visible crescent of the new moon as possible dates for the start of the month. The dates of the Bible start in the evening and last until the evening of the next day, so that gives us a three-day window for each biblical date. And the window for trumpets in 2012 was from October 15th to October 17th. On October 16th, 2012, the exact sign in heaven described in Revelation 12 occurred. The sign had not occurred before that since the year 1570 and will not occur again until the year 2454. So it's a very rare sign. And because it occurred exactly on the Feast of Trumpets by our method of calculation that year, that indicates that the method we use that year is correct. And the turn is meant to be observed before the first month starts. We've continued to use that method every year since 2012, and last year in 2016, the standard Jewish calendar aligned with our calendar because they observed their 13th month last year. But they did not observe their 13th month because of a late turn. They actually follow a human system known as the Metonic Cycle, which was created by a Greek astronomer in the 5th century BC. The metonic cycle is flawed, though, because it does not take into consideration the precession of the axis. But more importantly in this context is that God did not tell them to observe the calendar using a beast system. What God said to do is very simple, just observe the sun and moon and watch for the turn every year. With this calendar, we are not following any human created system. We are following the turn of the sun and moon only from our perspective on Earth. However, there's another element to this. The turn must be observed not only once per year, but twice per year. The reason for this is that the calendar is meant to be observed over the whole earth. Because Adam represents all of humanity, Jacob represents Homo sapiens, and the twelve tribes are the twelve tribes of humanity. Jesus confirmed that when he said Israel covers the whole earth. So the fact that the calendar is meant for everyone over the whole earth changes how we calculate the months because the first month has to be in the spring because it actually means spring. But the whole earth experiences two springs, one in the northern hemisphere and one in the southern hemisphere. And that may explain why the feast days of the first month align with the feast days of the seventh month. The Northern Hemisphere is observing their first month in the spring, while the Southern Hemisphere is observing their seventh month in their fall. And when the Southern Hemisphere is observing their first month in their spring, the Northern Hemisphere is observing their seventh month in their fall. And because we watch for the turn before the first month every year, this means we must watch for the turn before the first month in the North, and before the first month in the south. 
That means we must watch for the turn twice per year instead of only once. And that's why the calendar was off from September to January this past year, because we watched for the turn before the start of our month in the Northern Hemisphere last spring. But we didn't watch for the turn before the first month in the Southern Hemisphere during their spring. And usually this doesn't pose a problem, but this past year it did because the turn did not happen on the full moon of September 16th as expected. In other words, there was a 13th month on the Southern Hemisphere calendar. The 13th month, again, is a regular occurrence on a lunar solar calendar. It occurs approximately every two to three years. And it could happen either before the first month in the Northern Hemisphere or before the first month in the Southern Hemisphere. That means that in order for the Northern and Southern Hemispheres to stay in alignment, which they're meant to do, we must watch for the turn twice per year, once in the twelfth month and again in the sixth month. That seems to be what Exodus 34 is telling us. We need to check for the turn to was observed. Okay, I'll... Now, what I want to say is this, I didn't know what I was looking at at the time, but when I first moved here, the first year, I went outside every day and took pictures of the sky, and I noticed that where it was right in front of the house at some point, by the end of summer, it was in the middle of the street, just where it sat at, and I was just like, dang, I thought... <laughs> The um asteroid was on its way, but it was turning. In the 12th month of the Southern Hemisphere, which was the sixth month in the Northern Hemisphere. But in order to fully understand this, we need to look at every turn starting in 2012. So in March of 2012, the full moon, according to the Naval Observatory, occurred on March 8th. You can see it was rising to the right of due east in both the southern hemisphere here and the northern hemisphere here. But the sun was still setting to the left of due west at that time. So the turn had not occurred by the full moon of March 2012. So we waited one more month and looked for the turn on the full moon of April 6th. You can see the sun had finally made its turn by that date, so we started the first month in the northern hemisphere on the new moon of April 21st in 2012, and that was the start of the seventh month in the southern hemisphere. Then we need to watch for the turn again six months later in the sixth month on the northern calendar, which is the twelfth month in the southern calendar. On the full moon of September 30th, 2012, you can see the moon was rising to the left of due east, and the sun was setting to the left of due west. And just for reference, we'll show the date of the full moon on August 31st, the month before, which shows the sun setting to the right of due west. So by the full moon of September 30th, 2012, both the sun and moon had made the turn. So we started the first month of the Southern Hemisphere on the new moon of October 15th, and that was the seventh month in the Northern Hemisphere. That first day can either start on the new moon or the first visible crescent of the new moon, and the days start in the evening. So the first day of the month was either from the evening of October 15th to the evening of October 16th, or the evening of October 16th to the evening of October 17th. And again, the very rare sign of Revelation 12 occurred on October 16, 2012, right on the true Feast of Trumpets that year in the Northern Hemisphere, which indicates that this is the correct way to calculate the months, by watching for the turn before the first month of each calendar, both North and South. Next, in the 12th month in the Northern Hemisphere and the 6th month in the Southern Hemisphere, on the full moon of March 27, 2013, we can see the moon was rising to the right of due east and the sun was setting to the right of due west. Just for reference, you can see that one month before that, on the full moon of February, the sun was still setting to the left and the full moon was still rising to the left. So the turn occurred in 2013 on the full moon of March 27th. So we should have started the first month of the North
northern hemisphere on the next new moon of April 10th, and that would have been the seventh month in the southern hemisphere. Next, in the sixth month of the north and the twelfth month of the south, we observe the full moon of September 19th, and you can see that the moon was rising to the left of due east, but the sun was still setting slightly to the right of due west on that date. That year, the turn was observed on September 19th, but that was wrong because six months later, it became obvious that there was a 13th month because on the full moon of March 16th, the turn had not occurred yet and did not occur until the full moon of April 15th. So there was a 13th month in 2014, but it should have been observed in 2013 because that's actually when the delay occurred. So on the full moon of September 19th, 2013, the moon had made the turn, but the sun had not. So we should have waited another month and observed the full moon of October 18th. And you can see that the sun was setting to the left of due west on that date, and the moon was rising to the left of due east. So the turn occurred on the full moon of October 18th, 2013, and we should have started the seventh and first months on the next new moon of November 3rd. Then six months later, on the full moon of April 15th, which was the 12th month in the north and the 6th month in the south, we can see that the moon was rising to the right of due east and the sun was setting to the right of due west. Just for reference, you can see the month before that, on the full moon of March 16th, the sun was still setting to the left of due west. So the turn was complete by the full moon of April 15th, 2014, in both the sun and moon. So the first and seventh months began on the next new moon of April 29th. And that's how we observed it that year. Simply did not notice that there had been a 13th month, but we still were watching the turn before the first month in the northern hemisphere. So we did have that correct, just did not notice that there was a 13th month. So the new moon of April 29th was the first month in the spring in the northern hemisphere and the seventh month in the fall in the southern hemisphere. Six months later, if we observe the full moon of October 8th in the sixth month of the north and the twelfth month of the south, we can see the moon was rising to the left of due east and the sun was setting to the left of due west. Just for reference, the sun was still setting to the right of due west a month before that on the full moon of September 9th. So the turn was complete by the full moon of October 8th, 2014, and the next new moon on October 23rd marked the start of the seventh month in the northern hemisphere and the first month in the southern hemisphere. Six months later, in the twelfth month of the northern hemisphere and in the sixth month of the southern hemisphere, on the full moon of April 4th, 2015, we can see the full moon was rising to the right of due east, and the sun was setting to the right of due west. Just for reference, you can see a month before that, the moon was still rising to the left of due east on the full moon of March 5th, and the sun was still setting to the left of due west. Therefore, the turn was complete by the full moon of April 4th for both the sun and the moon, and the first and seventh months started on the new moon of April 18th, 2015. That was the start of the first month in the northern hemisphere and the seventh month in the southern hemisphere. Then six months later, in the sixth month of the north and the twelfth month of the south, we observed the full moon of September 28th, and we can see the full moon was rising to the left of due east and the sun was setting to the left of due west. For reference, we can compare that to the full moon of the month before, which we can see was still rising to the right of due east, and the sun was still setting to the right of due west. So the turn was complete by the full moon of September 28, 2015, and the first and seventh months started on the next new moon of October 13th. That was the seventh month in the northern hemisphere and the first month in the southern hemisphere. Then six months later, in the twelfth month of the north and in the sixth month of the south, we observe the full moon of March 23rd, 2016, 
and we can see the full moon was rising to the right of due east and the sun was setting slightly to the right of due west and that should have been our clue that the 13th month would be coming up six months later so the turn was complete on the full moon of march 23rd and we started the first and seventh months on the next new moon of april 7th then six months later in the sixth month of the north and the twelfth month of the south on the full moon of september 16th 2016 we can now see that the full moon was still rising to the right of due east and did not make its turn until the following month in ancient times they would have waited one full month and then made the trip to view the full moon of october 16th and we can see that by october 16th the full moon was rising to the left of due east and the sun was setting to the left of due west so the turn was complete not on the full moon of september 16th but on the full moon of october 16th 2016. That means that there was another 13th month on the Southern Hemisphere calendar last year. This means the Southern Hemisphere should not have started their first month until the new moon and first crescent of October 30th and 31st. And because the first and seventh month feast days are aligned, the Northern Hemisphere also must wait before we start our seventh month. Otherwise, we'd be out of alignment both with the turn of the sun and moon and also with the southern hemisphere. So the northern hemisphere should have started their seventh month, the Feast of Trumpets, on the window of October 30th through the 31st, 2016. And again, I apologize that I didn't see this earlier, but it is accurate. And this means that the next new moon after that, on November 29th, marked the eighth month in the Northern Hemisphere and the second month in the Southern Hemisphere. Then the new moon after that, on December 29th, marked the ninth month in the Northern Hemisphere and the third month in the Southern Hemisphere. And the new moon of January 28th, 2017, will mark the start of the tenth month in the Northern Hemisphere and the fourth month in the Southern Hemisphere. The new moon of February 26th will mark the 11th month in the north and the 5th month in the south. And the new moon of March 28th will mark the 12th month in the north and the 6th month in the south. So we observe the full moon of April 11th, 2017, and we can see that the moon will be rising to the right of due east, and the sun will be setting to the right of due west. Just for reference, you can see the month before that on the full moon of March 12th and see that the moon will still be rising to the left of due east. So the turn will be observed on the full moon of April 11th, 2017, and the next new moon after that on April 26th, 2017, will mark the ancient first month in the Northern Hemisphere and the seventh month in the Southern Hemisphere. So, in looking at the past five years, there was a 13th month in 2013 and another 13th month in 2016, which is right on schedule. So, we should expect another 13th month around 2019, but we'll look at that when we come to it. And again, I will be checking for the turn in the 6th and 12th months on the biblical calendar from now on, so as not to miss the 13th month when it happens again. So hopefully you can see why we are currently entering the 10th month in the Northern Hemisphere on the new moon of January 28th, 2017, and we will be in the 10th month until February 25th. And that makes the month of February another watch since the 10th month is always a watch in both the Northern and Southern Hemispheres because of Esther 216. And also because February 2017 is exactly 70 years from February 1947, which marked the exact month that the nations around Jerusalem were given to the eighth king. And that's a reference to the 70 years in Jeremiah 25. So for more information, please see the playlist Bibles Countdown to the Meteorite and Rescue. You can also find the ancient calendar video that goes into more depth on how the biblical calendar should be observed according to the Bible itself. Thank you so much to those who make this work possible. I hope you're doing well, and I will talk to you. Okay. <clears throat>
So, um, thank you for watching that. Now, I'm going to go. I haven't been to a couple of my brother's page. And I'm just going to play this out until it's time for me to go. I have a little free time. Yeah, P-H-Y-A. I have a little free time. Um, maybe this one. Oh, wow. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. Hey, brother. I haven't forgot about you. I have fallen off. I can admit that. Um, It's me, not you. Thank you for all your support. You've always supported. Um, I'm back over here checking out what you're doing. See. Let's check this out. Are y'all still with me? This is Brother Fire. So what I'm going to be reading five of these pairs include the isolated individual sentence at the top. I'm going to read this from a site called Biblioteca Accolades. I keep hearing about the Biblioteca, Biblio Ateca. Um, I'm going to check it out sooner or later, but right now, we bring you Indian Secret Societies from an Access Genealogy website. So true. Societies or brotherhoods of a secret and usually sacred character existed among many, very many American tribes, among many more doubtless than those from which there is definite information. On the plains, a larger number of these were war societies, and they were graded in accordance with the age and attainments of the members. Before I continue reading this, I read this, I actually did this video about a month ago. I deleted it. I didn't actually upload it. But let's get into some pretty heavy stuff, so caution. All right, let me continue. The Buffalo Society was a very important body devoted to healing disease. The Omaha and Pawnee seem to have had a great number of societies organized for all sorts of purposes. And uh, let me see if that video is up here. Excuse this look, detour, delay. I would suggest you go and check out this video. I actually unlock it. It's called Lodges the Blue Collar Spirit Industrial Force, not masonry, but carpentry. I'm going to unlock it, but I suggest you check it out. This. The Buffalo Society was a very important body devoted to healing disease, like modern day doctors. But we say the Omaha and Pawnee seem to have had a great number of societies organized for all sorts of purposes. There were societies concerned with the religious mysteries, with the keeping of records, sound like a library, and with the dramatization of myths, sounds like public theater, theatrics. Ethical societies and societies of mirth makers who strove in their performances to reverse the natural order of things. We find also a society considered able, able to will people to death, a society of big bellied men, and among the Cheyenne, a society of firewalkers who trod upon fires with their bare feet until the flames were extinguished. All right. According to Hoffman, the Grand Medicine Society or Midewiwin of the Chippewa and the neighboring tribes was a, a secret society of four degrees or lodges. 
into which one could be successfully inducted by the expenditure, I don't know that word, of a greater and greater amount of property on the accompanying fees. So I'm guessing some niggas have to get down. Uh, I should have uploaded the first video of this certain information, but I didn't. I'm wishing I did not, but no regrets. I wish I had no regrets. How'd I say? But let me continue. As a result of these initiations, the spiritual insight and power, especially the power to cure disease, was successfully increased on the purely material side. The novitate, no, novitiate, novitiate received the instruction regarding the medicinal virtues of many plants. The name of this society in the form Medu occurs in Delaware, where it was applied to a class of healers in the neighborhood of New York Bay. There was a body of conjurers who had no fixed homes, but tended to absolute continence or continued on foot, and both exercised sickness and officiated at the funeral rites. Their names interpreted by Brent to mean Great Snake and they participated in certain periodical festivals where a sacrifice was prepared, which it was believed was carried off by a huge serpent. Alright. I don't know if they're talking about the, the Levite, excuse me. I don't know if they're talking about the Leviathan or whatever. Let me continue. In Southwest, each Pueblo tribe contains a number of esoteric societies which mediate between men and zoomorphic beings of Pueblo mythology. At Zuni, there are 13 of these societies and they have to do especially with healing, either collectively in their ceremonies or through individual members. They also endeavor to bring rain, but only by means of influence which the beast gods are able to exert over the anthropic beings who actually control it. Rain bringing it itself is properly the function of the rain priest and of the Kotakili society, the latter consistent of Zuni of the male sex, and occasionally many Kivas um, okay, no corresponding to the six world quarters. And in their performances, members wear masks representing the anthropic beings, which they are then su supposed actually to embody, although they sing to them at the same time in order to bring showers. The rain priesthood and the priesthood of the bow are considered upon the under the caption of shamans and priests. But they may be Classed also as brotherhood is concerned respectively with rain making and war. <laughs> so I like somebody to dance around the fire going, hey, hey. Number 10. Atlas. Let's see about that. Alright. As Sire, the society of the Cougar presides over hunting. And there is also a warrior society. Parents apply to have their children admitted into a society or a person who has been cured by the society may afterward be taken in. A person may belong to more than one society and most of the societies also consist of two or more orders. The most important being that in which the members are endowed with the anagogy of medicines I um, actually would check that word out right now. Actually, can you find out where to come back to it later? Since the Hopi clans have been shown by folks to have been originally independent local groups, the secret society performances among them would appear to be nothing more than the rituals of the various groups. 
the societies themselves being the members of the groups on such rituals. <laughs> that's so amazingly all that's uh <clears throat> Societies and stands being the members of the groups owning such rituals and certain orders that have been granted a right to participate. The principal war society have that has resulted from a fusion of the warriors or war societies of all the clans of the Hopi Pueblos except one. Besides the two war society, the two societies devoted to curing of diseases. All of these brotherhoods devote themselves to bringing rain and stimulating growth of corn. Each is headed by a chief who is the clan chief, as well as the oldest man in his clan, or the OG, and contains several subordinate chiefs, while the oldest woman of the clan occupies a conspicuous place. So, back at you with the next one. Okay, I go over to check out the Brother Fire's page. Mm. He brings forth a lot of truth as well. Y'all, I am sounding tired because I am. I should have taken a nap. <laughs> but I didn't. So we gotta keep pushing. And this is what his home page looks like. He did one video, excuse me, another video. Um, this is part two. We are already one hour and 11 minutes in. All right, so I'm back at you with the next. Hopefully, you're going to check out part one to Indian Secret Societies and part two, the secret Indian Secret Society. And also, uh, this is the part three, which I will be finishing this off and bringing you to different information on other, well, not different information, but um, other brotherhood and secret societies. Dealing with this certain site, which is the Biblio Ateca. And I kept hearing it. I've been hearing that. Of okay, y'all, I'm about to end this. We already an hour and 11 minutes in. I don't want to get too lengthy. But y'all go make and show them some love. I also have to catch up on M.W. Smith. I'll just do that. I'm going to have to do that without y'all. All right. Peace and power to you. And I hope everybody enjoys their day.